from the latest on Caribbean cruises to kosher safaris, pilgrimages to Jewish Eastern Europe and award-winning wines and international cuisine in sun-drenched Tel Aviv. Sit back and enjoy the trip with the travel edition of the Jerusalem Post podcast. It begins with an L, so why is it pronounced word? <laughs> Polish is an odd language because the alphabet is more or less the same as the Latin alphabet. There is no letter X, X as we've just learned, and they have a very strange looking L. You know the Harry Potter lightning bolts? Yeah. So if you take just one of those, well, yeah, there is only one on Harry's head, and stick it across the downstroke of an L. Like a diagonal, I think they call it all. In Harry Potter, there isn't there a diagonal. Leave, that's yeah. something different. You're okay. confusing the story. Sorry. Anyway, you've got this thing across the L, and it no longer becomes an L. It becomes a? Were. So it's, is it a full were, or is it something between a ver and a were? Well, I think a were is a ver. That's the thing. So if you've got it's, a were, anyway. The reason you're still with us. The reason Mark has started our podcast this way is because we are in Poland, in Lodge, or Wudge, or yeah. Vudge. It's written L O D Z or L O D Z, and you know it as Lodge, but the locals call it Wudge. Well, we'll ask for confirmation, but we think it's Wudge. Wudge. This is the latest leg of our trip to Poland. We're going to be here for a day or two, and we're going to be learning about, actually, it's very interesting from my perspective as a, as a Mancunian, someone from originally from Manchester, and Mark, who lived in Manchester for many years, because this city is known as the Polish Manchester. And in true Manchester tradition, it's raining outside. <laughs> what we know at this stage is that Wudge was a manufacturing town in the realm of fabric, like Manchester was a cotton town. And with time, the industry disappeared here, went off to the Far East and to the Indian subcontinent and so on, and it left a lot of empty, large buildings. We're going to find out whether there are a lot of empty large buildings and what can be done with them. I suspect they're going to be filled with some wonderful things. I don't disagree. We're going to, as we usually do, wander the town that we're in. We've got some fabulous guides lined up who are going to be with us over the next couple of days. You'll be hearing from a lot of them. And when you say this is the next leg of our Poland tour, it's like a Polish person. It has two legs. Our first leg was in Poznan. If you want to listen to our tour of Poznan, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else like that. And you can always drop us a line to offer your thoughts and suggestions for the podcast, apart from delete. And the mail is markdavidpod at gmail.com. If you include our three previous Polish tours, then you have a Polish man with five legs. But let's not go over. <laughs> Shh. Time for a quiz question. The city of Lodz or Wudz is a pretty long way from the sea, which means it's got a rather ironic translation of its name into English. So what does Wudz mean in English? Swimming pool. The answer at the end of the pod. This is the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at Mark David Pod or mail us at markdavidpod at gmail.com. I'm going to start as I mean to go on and slaughter more of the Polish pronunciation. <laughs> but we're in Pivnica Wuczka. Is that the right pronunciation? Pivnica Wuczka, yes. It was close. <laughs> and we're with Tomek, who is the chief executive of the Lodge Tourism Organization. Lodge. Wuczka. <laughs> I'm going to keep that one in the podcast. Why have you brought us to this specific restaurant? Well, this is one of the, let's say, if we think about something local and uh, traditional, that might be the place to go. Uh, so Pivnica Wudzka means uh, like a lodge cellar. It's a family-run restaurant that serves lodge-type food, but with a modern twist. Uh, so it's not really a very traditional one, but it has this modern spirit. And, of course, you can feel in every single dish, you can feel the heart of the owners, of the chef, who is the, the guy who is running the, the kitchen, and the lady who is running the management of the restaurant. So this is a, a huge value that you can feel like on a home dinner here, 
having a good food, nice atmosphere, and that's why I think it's a good place for you guys. Sebastian, who is the owner and chef, spent a few minutes uh, with us. He's a big, imposing man with one of the firmest handshakes you will find anywhere. And he's got the warmest smile. And he was telling us a little bit about the creation of this restaurant. It's been around for nine years. We heard a little bit about the difficulties during COVID. But because of the uh, good spirits of the owner of the building and collaboration between them, he survived and now is serving up a storm. All of the products here are made fresh every day. And what's left over at the end of the day is very anonymously given into uh, social food areas that are available for poor and homeless people around the town. I'm going to pick you up on one thing that you said because we've got to get it right for the rest of the time. I just made fun of Mark for saying lodge and then you said lodge. As far as people outside of Poland are concerned, how should we be referring to your town? That depends if you want to be an advanced visitor or you want to be a beginner. The English version of the name of the city is of course Lodge because it has this L-O-D-Z letters that are available in uh, English grammar and uh, vocabulary. But if you express that in Polish, it has EU, which does not exist in any language except Polish. It's U, which is O with a comma over. Then we have a D that goes together with Z and comma again. So it's really a nightmare. It's a nice puzzle to start the, the sightseeing of Łódź to find out how this name actually should be spelled. We're going to be finding out over our couple of days here that there is a great film heritage to this place, including the hotel that we're staying in, where many of the bedrooms are uh, either replicas of movie sets or there are wonderful paintings from movies on, on the walls. And you told us that this town has a nickname associated with the film industry. Oh yes, which is very famous because of the cinematography and we have one of the best film schools uh, all over the world. It's actually listed by the Hollywood Reporter on the third place already with Vida, with Polanski as the graduates, one of the most famous graduates. Plus we have those um, estates or hotels that are connected with the film. We have Walk of Fame on the Piotrkowska Street and so on and so on. We're going to open very soon a, a museum of the Polish cinematography that is really will be located in a former power plant. So all together when you have that and we want to share it with the English speaking audience, we quite often we describe that as the Hollywood of Poland. Our coffees have just arrived. We've been talking about Wuj as a tourism destination. What are the themes of Wuj? Because Wuj doesn't have a, a big international airport near it. How do you bring people to Wuj? What's the selling point of Wuj? Accessibility of the city is quite good, for, especially for the UK market. So we have this direct connection with the Lodge Airport, Wuj Airport, plus the, the airport itself is located like 15 minutes away from the city centre. We have connections with UK, with the London, with East Midlands and also with Dublin in uh, Ireland. But we are also quite close, and this is our real window to the world, is Warsaw Airport, the Chopin Airport, that has connections with all major cities in Europe and uh, mostly in the world, and it's only one hour and uh, 15 minutes away from the city. From my perspective, at least, when we invite international travelers to the city, we sell them quite often for UK travelers as the Manchester of the East, so they know exactly what we are more or like uh, about. So we are all about the factories, former factories, cotton factories that are now converted into the uh, cultural institutions, into shopping malls, hotels, uh, or venues for different events and so on, that has the spirit, including the red brick and plastered brick in the construction, plus a modern design, really fancy style that you can feel kind of laid back and can talk to your friends, not paying a lot of money uh, and having a great time. Uh, so this is the spirit, this creative spirit that we want to sell to the travelers from outside Poland. It's not Rome. It's not a Venice. It's not even a Krakow. You said you're very honest about what it is. I'm always honest, but I think this is actually our strength. Because all those cities kind of generate their historical, they have this historical center. We are different. And this is our strength. We are not for everyone, but everyone who is coming here, they will either love us or will hate us. So it has at least uh, some memories from the place that we will be remembered in some way. And this is, how I feel, a really strong point. Vuj has had a turbulent 100, 150 years. It's gone from being Russian to Polish to Nazi occupation 
to communism and finally a free Poland for the last 30 years. Is it an opportunity to some extent for Vuj because effectively you're starting over? Well, this is, let's say, our, um, I feel like our third time that we resurrect from the ashes almost. <laughs> yes. The first time was in the 20s of the 19th century when the city was actually founded. Because for the many, many hundreds of years we were just a tiny village. When the decision was made that we're going to have a huge textile industry here, we started to develop really quickly. That was the first one. The second one was after the First and the Second World War, where parts of the city was destroyed, plus we lost a lot of people who were lived here, we lost entire Jewish almost community, we lost Germans that lived here, we lost Russians obviously, so we had to change, find a new ideas for the sound, and the further resurrection was in the 80s and 90s of the 20th century, when all those big factories collapsed at one point almost, at what time, and we had to find a new way, a new idea of the development of the city. And actually, what I feel is that for many years we were considered as the promised land. Now it's also a promised land, but for totally different purposes, not for industry, but for people who are looking for some creative ideas, yes, for young people mostly, for the people who are maybe not expecting an easy life, it will be a challenge at some point, but it will be really profitable for themselves, yes, so I feel that this is uh, one of the ways to do it. From my point, I'm really enjoying that you guys came here because it's something that you are the people who we want to have here as the people, uh, let's say, pricing the place at some point, but also seeing all the aspects of the city. We are real, and this is what I wanted to show you. We're really looking forward to our journey ahead for the next day or so in Vuj. How do people find out more information about Vuj? Well, we do have the website the, uh, that is available in English as well. It's lodge.travel. Uh, this is lodz.travel. Absolutely fascinating. We are looking forward to a couple of days of seeing this wonderful city. And I want to thank you for your honesty, frankness, because it's not something that we hear every day from tourism officials. Well, thank you so much. I really hope that you're going to enjoy the town. This is just your first evening, but I really feel that you're going to like it. Thank you, Tomek. The red bricks of Vuj are emblematic throughout the city. We have arrived at what would be the central point of the city's industry, dating back 150 to 200 years. We are in Manufactura, which is the complex that was owned by Israel Poznansky, founded by Israel Poznansky, predominantly a cotton mill, but really a manufacturing site of all types of industry. We'll hear a lot more about it from our guide, Anna, in a few minutes' time. But first of all, we have with us, somebody is going to show us how the machines operated way back when. Claudia, what are we looking at? These machines are 150 years old. Their looms are uh, 120 years old. What did these machines do? They are, uh, make material from cotton. We have to be careful standing behind the crate yeah. because the shuttle, which is a missile, a bullet in fact, yeah. yes, sometimes happens to be ejected and the speed of it is 60 kilometers per hour. So it's really very dangerous. My name is Anna Musiałowicz and I'm a city guide from Łódź, living here. The family dating back to 1840s, more or less. We'll get through the story of Manufactura over the next few minutes, but for you, how important is it for people to see what once was in this town? And as you said, you've many generations that you've lived here. So it's almost the story of your family or what your family saw for generations. Nowadays we should repeat the story, tell the story, um, to refer the, the, the history, to tell the young people what it looked like. They have some lessons at school, of course. They can see the remnants of the chimneys, they can see these red brick factories, but maybe they do not know the essence of the very hard work here. We have to remember that the working hour in Poznańskis factory for a short time were the longest uh, in Łódź. 
and up to 16 hours per day, which is unimaginable nowadays with short breaks only for meals, maybe for the lunch was longer. Of course, the victory of the working people was to fight for eight hour working day, which they finally, at the beginning of the 20th century, managed to achieve. This is important to remind to some and to learn the, the youngsters. Wuj is 600 years old this year, 2023. For the first 400 years, it was a backwater. It was a village. Nobody would necessarily have wanted to come here. There's a small town 40 kilometers away, which you said was far more important in those days. How did what Poznanski and his rivals, what they achieved, how did that change the shape of Wuj? It was a huge contrast from the sleepy village to this vibrant city with all the problems of the capitalistic city which didn't have a human face in those times. So we know that the exploitation uh, was very heavy, the pollution was terrible here. This is where from one of the nicknames of which is Chimneyburg, or Bad City which was the title also of the novel by one of the 19th century writers written in an expressionistic style, Bad City, because of this exploitation and uh, diseases, pollution. 21st century manufacturer is a very different place. Having walked around the museum of the factory, we are standing by the windows overlooking a very large square. What is a manufacturer today? This is 27 hectares or maybe even more, full of life, very popular with people from Łódź and region, also Poland, coming here during summer, for example, for concerts or beach, which we have here at the shopping mall and food court, then a skating ring during winter time, and uh, a lot of cafes, three museums, shopping mall, the place which is uh, very friendly full during uh, summer and warm season full of flowers uh, with the fountains which resembled that which came into its industrial being due to many small rivers fast flowing rivers so the fountains stress it so it's a vibrant place just worth seeing we can't see this exploitation we can't see the industry here only some remnants still worse to to be here and to stay here Yes, it's a vast leisure complex. We've seen a large shopping mall. There are rows and rows of restaurants. There's an art museum, dance studios. How popular is this site? I was told by the man who is the president of our Wood Tourist Organization that in the 2018 there were 18 million people passing through or attending various events or uh, going to the shopping mall, uh, to the restaurants in Manufactura. It was compared to the movement of tourists in Barcelona, visiting La Sagrada Familia. So, of course, not all the people here are the tourists, as I said, the shoppers and also the inhabitants of food coming on the daily basis here, but still such a traffic. So huge crowds of people coming to this highly popular center. It really is a sight to behold, just the scale of it, the breathtaking beauty of the red bricks integrated with the shops and the restaurants and the bars and the life. It's a model for other cities out there. When their industry declines, how do you bring back the city to life? And Vuj truly has done that. Just across the courtyard, I guess, from Manufactura is what was the Poznanski Palace. What for me is quite remarkable about this is this is a stately home, a mansion, beautiful, and yet from many of the windows it has a full view of the factories just across the way. Mark, over to you. Maybe that was so no one would leave work early because you knew the boss was looking out. It's, it's an extremely opulent building. The one thing you do notice, though, is the mix of styles. It's as though 
every couple of years they've said we need to make this more opulent add a bit of gold in this corner and more letter p's to say poznanski apparently the poznanski said when uh, talking to the architects and designers when they offered him styles he said i want all of them now this is not just the poznanski mansion these days it's also the city museum we should find out more from anna the building originally was uh, very humble developed from the existing one in the 70s of the 19th century, L-shaped, later on gradually developed by a few quite famous architects. The museum of uh, nowadays was established in 1975. It's owned by the city, developed by the city, consisting of three big exhibitions and also serving as a movie plan for various Polish movies. Richly decorated, the venue of concerts and lectures, which also illustrates very rich, even if short, history of Łódź. Uh, so not only the Poznańskis family were the residents of the place, but in between the wars, the um, authorities of the city. And during the war, when uh, which was included into the Third Nazi Republic, it became a seat of the Nazi German authorities. As we walk down the central staircase, can you tell us about the people featured in the museum. It's not just the Poznanskis, it's other sons and daughters of Wuj. Yes, some celebrities, uh, as we call them nowadays. One of them, Arthur Rubinstein, a well-known all over the world pianist who specialized in Chopin's music, having four homelands, as, as he used to say, being born in Łódź, living in France and in the USA, and being buried, according to his will, his ashes are in Israel. So, Arthur Rubinstein. Also, Marek Edelman, a cardiologist by profession, but first of all, known as a leader of Warsaw Uprising in 1943, being a um, very honest man of principles, uh, severe character, but straightforward and famous man. listening to the Jerusalem Post podcast travel edition. Wuj fact file. You can fly into Wuj airport from London, Milan, Brussels and Dublin. The airport is just four miles from the city centre. There are taxis and the numbers 65A and B buses from just outside the terminal. Warsaw's Chopin Airport is 90 minutes by car and two hours by train from Łódź. The OK bus services Łódź from Chopin. You can fly directly into the Polish capital from Tel Aviv, Newark, New York, Toronto, Frankfurt, Munich, Paris, Rome, Amsterdam, Dubai and Istanbul, among many others. Four-star hotels include the Doubletree, Holiday Inn, Ambassador Premium, Ambassador Centrum, Puro Wuj Centrum and Novotel Wuj Centrum. There are also lots of apartment rentals throughout the city. The currency is the Polish Złoty, written everywhere as PLN. One dollar will buy you 4.3 Złoty as of March 2023. The summers are comfortable and partly cloudy, and the winters are long, windy and mostly cloudy. Over the course of the year, the temperature typically varies from minus 5 Celsius or 23 degrees Fahrenheit to 24 Celsius or 75 Fahrenheit. Recommended eateries include Pivnica Wuczka, Prova Kiezny Miln, Anatevka and Imba. The last two are both Jewish style but not kosher. Kosher food is available from the Wuj-based Kosher Delight Poland. Their website is kosherdelightpoland.net. How was lunch, David? Lunch was very, very nice. We went to a place called Imbel, which um, on the outside, on the main long street, it's a four kilometer, three mile long street, you can see the sign for Imbel and it has on it a shofar and a menorah. 
That was very nice. And in the style of a number of Polish restaurants we've been to, it tries to merge together Jewish cuisine with local tradition. Herring. It was very nice, the herring. And, and the tea, the ginger or cherry tea, was fabulous. We are in a former power plant in the east of Wuj. It's called EC1 now, and it is a center of science. But what it also does is brings to life the old coal-fired power station. My name is Alina. Nice to meet you. Uh, right now we are staying inside of the one of the boilers. The temperature in here usually like starting from 900 until 1,400. So we wouldn't be able to walk so freely in here for sure. As you can see, uh, those tubes in here, the function of them uh, was to produce the steam. So it was like, to simply say, like a, like a huge kettle in here. Can you tell us about the history of this site? This place uh, is the first wood commercial power plant. Uh, everything that you can see around those machines in front of you, they are original ones by the size, but you can see them cut it in some parts so you can look and see how it works inside of it. How long has the EC1 been open? This uh, place started functioning as a culture center in uh, 2016. We've spent the last hour or two wandering around what was the first commercial power plant in Wuj and is now this wonderland for children, for adults, for families. We've been doing it in, in your company, you've been a wonderful guide. Outside of the story of the plant and the machines that people can play with and the buttons they can press to see how power was generated, what else can people do when they visit this area? It's a really nice uh, place, especially for families, for kids to spend weekend uh, because they uh, can spend time just checking those experiments that we have on different topics like physics, biology. Uh, you can as well try yourself like a worker of this power plant. So there's lots of things to do. And we've also been up to the top of the cooling tower. Within this complex, there are a couple of other things. You've got a, a comic centre that's going to be opening pretty soon this year. And you've also got a planetarium. Uh, we also have a planetarium and uh, in there you can see different uh, movies uh, with which you can travel through the space. Uh, you can also uh, visit some uh, special concerts that they have in here. For example, I've been visiting a few months ago, they were showing one of the Pink Floyd albums uh, on the huge screen, it's really impressive as well. There's lots and lots for people to do, whether they're Polish or whether they're foreign. What about language? Is everything in Polish? It depends on the particular like uh, movie, but uh, usually it's more for watching than listening actually, especially in Planetarium or our 3D cinema. And here within EZ1, the power plant, everything is in English as well as in Polish. If people want to know more, is there a website that they can go to? Yeah, of course, we have a website, it's at Sayeden Woods, called and in here you can get to know more about our programs, uh, what we have. We also, this center is making uh, lots of master classes in laboratoriums, for example, for kids about biology. You can see different stuff through microscopes and stuff like that. Thank you very much indeed. It's been a lovely, lovely afternoon for us. Thank you as well. Hi, this is David Harris from the Jerusalem Post podcast, Travel Edition. Find us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter at MarkDavidPod or mail us at MarkDavidPod at gmail.com. We've taken a long drive through Vuj past the power station again. We've seen some of the factories and their new use a project called OFF, which has turned old factories into restaurants. We drove through Woods and we saw some of the tenement buildings that need restoration. Apparently there are some 3,000 buildings requiring restoration. Woods is a mix of rebirth and 200 years of industry where the industry has gone and people have moved on. One of the things that our guide Anya was talking about as we were making our way through the town is the educational side of things. So 
you know, you think of uh, this as being an industrial town, but of course that's its past and it has its future to look forward to. And it has institutions where uh, students learn music and medicine. The university's speciality is in humanities. Uh, and I think the town is very proud of its educational facilities. We've come to something that would be a focal point of our tour, an important part of the Jewish history of Vuj. This is actually the new cemetery. There is an older cemetery, but from, I would say, the turn of the 20th century, maybe beforehand, this cemetery came into being. And again, you can see the contrast of Vuj. As you walk round, you see some enormous mausoleums, enormous gravestones belonging to the Jewish industrialists from the turn of the century. And there at the back corner of the cemetery, there is a field, which is the field where the dead from the Vuj ghetto have been buried. This is the or one of the largest cemeteries in Europe. It started in 1892. There is pretty much nothing left to see of the original cemetery, which was in the middle of town. As opposed to certain other places in Poland, remember that this city is a new city. Even though it's celebrating 600 years this year, that was as a village and it's only been the last 150, 200 years that it's been a sizable city. So our guide Anya has, has been taking us around. Just talk through some of the highlights of this cemetery, things that, that people can see here if they visit. The cemetery is over 40 hectares. We can see that in general, the Matsevas here are rather humble, but we can see some huge construction structures like the mausoleum of the Poznański, one of these uh, cotton kings of ours. He also gave some area of his property for the sake of the cemetery. Cemetery is neglected, unfortunately, with very picturesque uh, tombstones, Matsevas, but neglected is because we do not have Jewish population who could take care of it. There are people who volunteer, there are people coming from the city, not related to Jewish community or not ethnic, but they want to help to clean as it's considered a historical monument. We can see that there are some tombstones which refer to some ancient Greek architecture or some Art Nouveau style. There is a tombstone of Rapaport, one of the industrialists in Łódź. There are also very modest, humble tombstones like uh, the one of the Rubinstein's parents, Arthur Rubinstein, a famous pianist. Very moving area is uh, the ghetto field where we can't see trees, only small plaques. The grass is not high, so during uh, autumn and springtime, which say who was buried, and uh, we only know that over 40,000 people who died because of malnutrition, because of very cold winters, which um, prevailed during the 40s of the 20th century, so the people were buried there. We're conducting this interview in the pre-burial hall. This is where people would have been brought from the hearse, um, they would have been uh, ritually cleansed, and then uh, family members and friends would have gathered to hear speeches about the life of the departed prior to burial. There's also here an exhibition right now of photographs which show what this area was like pre-war and also these are photographs of what burials were like during the period of the ghetto. In addition to the famous people, there's also at least one infamous person buried here. Tell us about him. Well, in Famous, yes, but at the same time a local legend, the so-called Blind Max, who had some problems during the Russians governing here, so uh, we, when we were under Russian partition, and he had problems with Kazakhs, with, uh, so he lost his eyesight, partially at least, but it didn't prevent him from stealing and teaching young adepts how to steal, so uh, they trained in his own house how to become pickpockets. And there is a tombstone covered with small coins because people want to remember that, in fact, he was called also Robin Hood here, stealing but also sharing some money. And 
as he knew uh, a lot of uh, people, he was also very helpful for the local police. An anecdote, but uh, almost true, <laughs> with a violinist named Huberman, who brought very uh, precious, very expensive violin here to give a concert in Łódź, and then it was uh, the instrument was stolen uh, from the coach uh, by which Huberman was traveling. So the uh, police, local police, uh, went to uh, blind marks to ask him to pull the strings, you know, and he managed to uh, regain the, the, the violin, so Huberman was ready for the concert on the next day or next two days. So there, it was one of the events with blind marks. Menachem Borstein was his name. Walking around the exhibition, you can see there is a plan, or they call it the revalorization concept where over the next two years there will be an investment of around 150 to 200 thousand dollars in making the ghetto field more accessible putting gravestones there putting memorials there there is a small jewish community in Vuj, you can see who take a small part in the upkeep of the cemetery dave and i have been around europe and seen cemeteries that are not as well kept as this it isn't perfect by any means but that there is some level of upkeep here I, th- I think for me one of the most poignant things we saw in what is still an active cemetery in the graves near the front there was a gravestone of four people that were killed on the way to a conference in Poland in 1946 members of the Mizrahi B'nai Akiva movement that you and I used to belong to and there are shirts there from the movement of people that have come and visited the grave there is still some activity in in this graveyard definitely in terms of the jewish community here our guide daniel was saying that there are some 300 to 500 active members that there is a community center here so even though there are things here that are tragic that are awful from our past there is still also an active jewish life here as well i think one last point to note is Although it's a Jewish graveyard, an area at the back of the graveyard has been given over to Roma and Sinta victims of the Holocaust and the Home Army of Poland. And on our drive here, just on the other side of the long road that we came down, still part of the old ghetto, there is a memorial to the children's camp that was kept here of Polish children, mainly orphans, that were kept in poverty and in slave labor in a camp by the Nazis. Hello, I'm Catherine Trella and I work for Education Department of Central Museum of Textiles in Łódź. Textile Museum. We've certainly touched on cotton here. Was this a later stage in the process or was this another cotton factory that's exhibiting what was made in Wuj? It is a former textile factory in Łódź, but over the years, step by step, these buildings were revitalized and adapted for exhibition purposes. The idea of making this former factory as a museum was initiated by Kristina Kondratiuk around 70 years ago. And it was a very extraordinary idea at that time in Poland. Thanks to her passion and to her commitment, this museum is one of the largest textile museums dedicated to textile in all perspectives. I mean, as a field of art, as an industry issue, and related to fashion and everyday life. How can textiles, when I think of textiles of cotton production, I think of the t-shirt that I'm wearing now, the, the socks that I'm wearing now. How does that translate into art? It's something which is complementary. I mean, the way of thinking of textile can be very diversified. Sometimes we use textile as clothes or garments, but on other way, textile or tapestry can be understood as a work of art, equally as uh, paintings or sculptures. When we approached this building, it had a different frontage to a lot of the factories we've seen here. Most of the factories have been very red, but there was a white front to this factory. Can you tell us about this factory that when it was built and why it looks different to some of the other factories here? The white factory was built between 1835 and 1886 by Ludwig Geyer, 
who was a German immigrant and came here in the first half of 19th century from Germany with his family. And it, he built this classicist complex of building, painted white because it was the most representative wing of the factory. Another one you can see at the back is still red. And uh, it was built in 1886 by his sons. And it's one of the most beautiful examples of uh, industrial architecture in Poland. A visitor comes here, what are they going to see? What are they going to do? What are they going to experience? Mm -hmm. Well, in our museum we have both permanent and temporary exhibitions. One of uh, permanent exhibitions is the um, City Fashion and Machines exhibition. It's divided in three parts, composed on three floors. One part presents the history of Łódź as a dynamically growing and changing city. Another part is dedicated to fashion, so it shows shop uh, windows expositions and it recalls uh, Piotrkowska Street as a longest catwalk in Europe and reminds also very famous Polish brands and labels like uh, Telimena, Moda Polska, Nestor, which coexist together with bazaar clothing and unique clothes made by graduates from Academy of Fine Arts in Łódź. Third part of this exhibition shows different textile machines like looms, like uh, spinners, dated from the second half of 19th century and 20th century, so you can trace and learn the secrets of textile production on the industrial scale. The interior shows big weaving mill from 19th century and 20th century. There are eight looms running every 30 minutes. So you've studied the history of this city for the last 200 years and perhaps before when it was a village as well. If you had to pick an era in which you would want to live, mm -hmm. would it be in those days where maybe the work was a bit harder or is today the best time to be living here? Well, I think this is uh, the most appropriate time for me to live here. The working conditions in 19th century for factory workers were really hard. Like they used to work here for 12 hours a day, six days a week. So in dust, in terrible noise. So I would say it was very hard and uh, dangerous work as well because no health and safety issues were implemented at that time in 19th century till the beginning of 20th century. Now it's the chance to give people the web address so they can find out more before they plan their visit to Łódź. You're very welcome to come here and if you want to check out our website it's cmwl.pl. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you very much. Mark, should we go and have a look at the exhibitions? We should. Mark, what's your favourite film or movie? Uh, Godfather 2. Which was made in, what, the 70s? Yes. Would you today watch a movie from the silent age? I used to like Harold Lloyd. I remember growing up as a teenager watching Harold Lloyd, a little bit of Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, for novelty's sake, but probably not. And your kid, who's 20? I'm not even sure if he has seen silent movies. My kids have got no idea who Laurel and Hardy were that I grew up with. But where we are now, we're, I think, at an age where not even Harold Lloyd and Laurel and Hardy were a, sort of a twinkle in the eye. Let's talk to a lady who could tell us exactly where we are. Hello, I'm Joanna. We are here in the Film Museum in Łódź, in Poland in the palace of Karol and Anna Scheiblers, when the museum is located. And now we are uh, in the exhibition Film Łódź, which tells the story of uh, our city, Łódź, in the context of cinematography and how it developed. We already visited 
one of the other uh, properties of, of a rival industrialist on the other side of town. And when all of the mills and the machines became silent, they decided to create what we've seen as Manufactura, which has become an entertainment and shopping centre with some museums. How come that this particular place, which was the palace of the industrialist Scheibler family, ended up becoming a museum of the moving image? I think mostly by incident, unfortunately, yes, but here all our workers who are really devoted to the museum and to bringing up the history of its place, and they try really hard to combine the historical aspect of the place, the history of uh, its family, and the cinematographic heritage that we present here. We've started downstairs in these beautifully tiled kitchens. The first machine we saw was a kinetoscope, which I think in England we used to call what the butler saw machines, where, where the early start of pornography came from. But we've come into a much larger room, and central in this room is a great big wooden structure. What is this? It's a photoplasticon, it's called Kaiser Panorama, and it's made by August Furman, it was the inventor of the machine. And this particular machine is from his workshop. So it's uh, original, it's over uh, 100 years old. And I think besides its usage, it's just a masterpiece of wooden construction, it's just beautiful. And it was used mostly before the era of radio and cinema, uh, when people did not travel so much, so they can learn something about the news around the world, about other countries, or just have some fun. So it's like Pathé News 60 years before Pathé News ever existed. We also just heard some beautiful music from a machine that you had to wind up, put a coin in, and then we saw barrel turning around and wooden pieces chiming against bells. What is that? How was it used? It has a beautiful name, Orchestron, but it's simply known as a music machine. It's also original. It was uh, reconstructed. All the instrumental pieces inside were reconstructed. Its main aim is to imitate an orchestra. So, for example, it was used in some restaurants, in uh, wealthy people's houses to entertain the, the parties. We're one floor further up now in the old Scheibler house overlooking the factory in the Museum of Cinematography. I've seen my second Oscar of this trip. I'm now being spoilt. We've come to a room where there are images of some more recognisable people to our listeners. Roman Polanski, there's a picture of Harrison Ford, I can see Sean Connery. How much did Polish cinema cross over into Hollywood? Unfortunately, more in the past years. But now we have strong uh, representations like uh, Paweł Pawlikowski or uh, Małgorzata Szumowska. And here on this wall, they are the graduates from film school in Łódź who gained some main awards in film industry. The town, one of its many names, is Hollywood. What about this town and cinema? How important is it for the town? So after the uh, Second World War, after the destruction of Warsaw, all the film production companies on the film industry came to to Łódź, and Łódź became the the capital city of the cinematography of of that time. So to imitate the famous uh, name Hollywood, they changed it into Hollywood. In the previous room, there was a map of Wuj, and it was covered in pictures of films that had been shot in Wuj on location. In 2023, what is filmed in Wuj today? How busy is the film industry? I think it's more now concentrated on animation. There are a few animation studios that 
have some uh, successes and uh, are famous even um, outside our country. But unfortunately, the movie sets are not so often seen on the streets now. In terms of looking back, especially I assume for older residents of the city, how much pride is there in that, that heritage for the people to think about and to teach their children, grandchildren about what was here? A lot of pride. We witness it uh, during making interviews with people who worked on uh, movie sets, uh, different parts of, uh, of jobs, and they were really proud and they um, recalled these, those memories with, uh, with tears and with, with laugh. And we observe here in, in our museum grandfathers walking around with their grandkids and explaining how, how was it back then. The cinema industry in Vuj really took off after World War II. Vuj had a very large Jewish community before World War II. Is there much Jewish cinema in Poland? Of course, there is a whole um, section of Jewish cinematography in the history of Polish cinema because the viewers were really huge group of people so uh, it was affordable and to make those movies but uh, I think now most of the people don't know that there were such movies and they are not unfortunately played or remembered in any way. It's been a, an amazing walk around this museum. I could spend hours here. It's really entertaining and fascinating. Is it accessible for English-speaking visitors? Absolutely. We have audio guides in English for free. You can take them in the just entering the, the museum. And uh, everything is translated in, in English. So all the texts and subtitles for the movies all are translated into English. How do our listeners find out more about the museum? So you can uh, go to our website, museumkinematography.pl or you can find us on the Facebook, for example, or Instagram, Film Museum in Łódź. We are there and we are very active, posting all the time. So that's museumkinematography.pl Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing us around this museum. It's been wonderful. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so tired. Really, listener, I am not complaining, but we go to these places for 24, 36, whatever it is, 72 hours, and they cram it in. I found that tough. I think I'm a little under the weather. You looked a bit peaky. It was a very intense 48 hours in Vuj. 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 <laughs> we still at it. Oh, oh Tom Eck will be cringing when he listens Sorry to this podcast. That. I really would recommend people come and take time out of their schedule to see Woods. In some ways, it's a real contradiction. It's like a rise and fall and rise again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and certainly for me, as someone Jewish of Polish origin, to see the Poznanskis and going to the graveyard and seeing that... I mean, if this was a modern-day graveyard, that mausoleum would have air conditioning, music, a bar. I don't think I've ever seen anything that large. And on the other hand, if we're talking about the Jewish cemetery, then, of course, there's all, all of the tragedy wrapped up in that. But also, as, as you and I have crossed Central Eastern Europe, we know that the cemeteries and the buildings that are still there are not just there to talk about or to remind us of the tragedies, but also of the amazing contribution that Jewish people made to life in Poland and surrounding countries, in Poland's case, for a thousand years. The one thing you can see about Łódź is in between the golden period at the beginning and then the Holocaust and communism, it did a lot of damage to the city. But what you can see now and what really makes it a great place to visit is, is how they've taken that and started to rebuild the city. Manufacturer, the restaurants, Piotrkowska Street and all the shopping there, the museums. I loved EC1, the power station. Yeah, yeah was, that was definitely was fabulous. It would be fascinating for our, uh, you know, Lord willing, great-grandchildren to visit some of these places, especially a place like Woods, which has reinvented itself twice, uh, and see what it's like 100 years from now. Should we um, say a few thank yous? Yes, we should. 
Firstly, thanks to Tomek, Nastia and Nadia from the Woods Tourism Organisation. And Dorota, you're going to have to forgive me because in the last podcast, he did it first. But thank you to Auntie Dorota for looking after us again. She is the, the connection between Poland and Israel for the Polish Tourism Organisation. Thank you, Dorota. Quiz time. Very simple question. Maybe the answer was a little bit harder. What does Wuj mean? even though it's far from the sea. The answer, Mark? It's a boat. It is a boat. In fact, it's a yellow boat. Did we ever establish why? Is it because I look a bit yellow and peaky, as you said the other day? (laughs) Is it because it's a bit like Manchester and Liverpool, where they've got the yellow submarine? So Uh, Vudge has the... Well, back to Manchester and Liverpool, which Manchester was inland, but you had the shipping canal to take the cotton out of Manchester for export or to bring it in from India, uh, the same way the waterways, the rivers for Wuj have been incredibly important through the development of the city. I think it's time for us to to say goodbye. I'm going for a lie down because I am (laughs) exhausted, but it's been a wonderful trip. Send us your thoughts. Uh, If you've got comments, you can mail us markdavidpod at gmail.com and our social media at markdavidpod and remember to subscribe folks have a wonderful couple of weeks hopefully we'll be back the next time with some more adventures on the jerusalem post podcast travel edition goodbye farewell 